asking what in the world, like why on earth would we start a message that way? Um, all of you fellas and ladies that have a, a military connection, background, history, currently active, uh, previously, first, thank you, but let me just also say, if that didn't get your juices flowing just a little bit, uh, something's wrong with you. And I didn't, I, listen, it just so happens that there's a new Top Gun movie coming out this week. This doesn't have anything to do with that. Just want to tell you that. Uh, I may go see it, maybe this week. I, I, I hadn't even thought about it till all of a sudden. Listen, um, and I'm supposed to start by saying, are you ready for takeoff, right? Um, but, but here's the deal. Um, Bay County, just for a second, twice a year we do perhaps the largest military exercise for aircraft to maintain air dominance in the United States um, right here in Bay County at Tyndall Air Force Base. They do it in May. They do it in November. They bring in some 90 or 100 aircraft this past week. I think it was 1,347 men and women that came to this area. They came from all over the world, um, or at least all over the, na the nation. There were some guys, I think, from, from, uh, from Britain that were here. But the point is this. Um, well, the reason I'm fired up is because I actually got to, I got to see some of these jets do what they do. Um, and, and so it was really kind of cool. But here's the gig. Um, as Americans, you would probably want to know that they do that in order to be able to maintain air dominance. Um, it's almost like uh, dare I talk about college football? It's almost like college football taking taking their A team against the like their number one offense against number one defense, knowing that in the game, if they're a really really good team, they're not going to face anybody like who they are. And so, just kind of, you know, I'm a Christian first, right? And I'm a pastor, but I'm a, I'm 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 a red blooded American male at some point. And there's something about me that's just like, oh, it's awesome that like we know we won't face anybody out there like what we face here. So they're out there doing that. If you'd wonder what all that noise is, they're like, literally, it's the only time they get to shoot live missiles. You're like, wait, what? No, they went through all the stuff about the environment. I promise you sea turtles are safe and all that good stuff. But did you hear me say that they got to shoot live missiles? Like, they have a range out there that's incredible. And the idea that some of these planes and these pilots, this is the only time that they get to load the live ones and get to actually fire those suckers. And they're doing it with people that they actually, in live combat, if they ever face it, folks from all around the country that they actually would be uh, participating with, which makes us better, right? So what's the connection? Well, I want to show you a different plane. Well, obviously, these are the F-22s. Guys that talk about this will argue pretty vehemently. I may have some of you guys giving me a different opinion later. Uh, Brother Monty, would make for a fun talk for us to have one day um, about this. But the F-35 is a different bird, if you will. The F-22 is like a sports car, right? Two-engine, small aircraft. Um, I'm not even going to go into the payload side. There's two, this F-35 got like stealth mode and a beast mode. We're going to look at beast mode. Hit me with the, 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 the cool pick of the F-35. This thing's loaded for bear right here. Most of what they do, you can't even see. Like, like when, they, when they're aiming, I mean, their, their range out here in our Gulf, which makes us so unique. Man, if I got you just, just, just for a second, I want to get your attention. The, these guys... Um, off the coast are, 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 are in a zone basically from Pensacola to what they call the armpit of Florida, Way, it, it, which is, there's nothing bad about that place, good fishing over there. But it's a long-range deal. And to be able to play with that aircraft, that F-35, and what it can do, it carries huge amounts of ordnance. Now, what you see right there is a missile being fired off the wing. And specifically, I've said all this to get you to a very specific aspect. Isn't that fancy circling right there? I did that all by myself. Um, I mean, I am high tech. And so... That little, you see the, the, the missile's off to the, to the side, but it comes off of a rail. And when they describe this, like I'm having to pick up the military lingo because I just don't get it, right? Like I, I don't ever hear this stuff. This is literally what it means when they say they're going to fly missiles live off the rail, which for, you know, the guys that do that, it's like, oh, is it today yet? Uh, and so here's the gig. How does this connect to us? Well, for number, number one, when we talk about so many of you that have, go, have changed, like you're going from different phases. Some of you have, you got some graduating kindergarten, you got them graduating fifth grade, you got graduating middle school, uh, high school, college. Maybe you're just doing it, moving into a different phase of life because you got no kids at home and no bills to pay anymore, right? That's not exactly how that works, is it? Um, and so regardless, regardless, as you get into these next phases, when you ultimately graduate one out, you're launching them into life, and you're sending them live off the rails. You catch that? Like literally sent, as in you don't have the control you used to have, as in now it's time to do what you've been trained to do, right? And just in case you think like I'm giving you this big warm-up version for the graduates in the next session, don't get me wrong, I'm going to be real personal with them. But it should be real personal with you guys, and here's why. 
when Peter was restored by Christ and he tells them, hey, the Holy Spirit's coming. You want to know what happened to them in Acts 1 and 2? The early church was launched. Like literally, the gospel of Jesus Christ was sent by the apostles as gospel missiles. The word missile is not in the Bible anywhere. Neither is the word missionary, by the way. The concept is that we are ambassadors for Christ. Literally, and we think about the apostles as being just a group that was there. And those guys were the apostles. And everybody since then is a, well, they're not necessarily chosen. They're not necessarily sent. They're not necessarily responsible to be the actual workers and gospel, like the good news bearers. Well, can I just tell you that's wrong? There's no question that the apostles, capital A, those guys, same word, by the way, apostolos. It's a Greek thing. And so those guys, the original ones that that Jesus described that way, they literally saw things in, well, they saw the birth, death, life, resurrection of Jesus Christ. We didn't see that. Um, I've witnessed, I've witnessed um, new life in Christ. And so without getting into a ton of the details I don't want to get into today, I want to just tell you that the, the gospels literally use the word apostolos, sent, for people like you and me. Uh, it's so much a part of the story. And so as we look at Peter's journey, that's still where we're at. We're looking at his journey, his faith journey, what takes place after the time. I mean, like real life, real faith, and the real Jesus. What does it mean? I mean, you don't want me to, uh, to just tell you what you want to hear. You don't want me to give you the company line. Like, you, you're sick of all that, right? You've heard enough of that over the, over the years. And so I just want to dig into the Word in Acts chapter 1. And the time that we've got, or at least until I run out of time, and give you, give you some gospel right here. And hopefully... Hopefully, when we head out, it'll be time for you to take out. Like, like, some of you need to go Bible study. Like, well, that's what we need to do first. But then whenever we go out into the world, we're sending you out. You're, you're launched as a gospel missile. You like that? A gospel, if, if you don't remember any, I'm going to this week as a gospel missile. All right, so Acts chapter 1. Y'all ready? I'm going to take a deep breath. I hope I got your interest peaked. Acts chapter 1. So the writer of the gospel of Luke also was the one that put pen to paper uh, or papyrus, or whatever scroll they put it on, um, in Acts. And so uh, he begins to record the early happenings after the resurrection of Christ, and it starts off this way. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with that which Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up, and after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So he's given, these, he's given them instructions. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering, at, after the, the cross and the resurrection, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days. Take note of the 40 days because this is the only place in Scripture that tells us that that, that's how long these appearances were. Uh, There's another place in in uh, one of the letters to the church at Corinth that tells us that there were many appearances to large groups of people over that period of time. But this is where we know it's 40 days. And so it says 40 days and speaking, he, he would get with them speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them... He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, this was going to be very significant in the life of the church. Um, in, in, in the song King of Kings that we described, it talked about the, the Spirit lit the flame, right? So after the cross of Christ, the Spirit lit the flame. What does that mean? That is a picture of what took place in the Scripture when the Holy Spirit, instead of residing on people periodically for incredible acts, which is what happened in the Old Testament, right? Samson would, for a moment, have uh, spirit empowerment to, uh, to be an incredible warrior, right? Or there's another one, it, it, different ones, they, they, they could run fast, or they could do certain things, or we see time stand still in one point. Those were all specific moments that the Holy Spirit was there, but then it wasn't continual. You and I today, you need to hear this, like, you, you need to know this is true, the promise we have in Christ is that God is with us always. Like, he's here now, and from the moment that, 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 that these baby, they're not baby girls, these young ladies, but from the moment they accepted Christ, like, God's present. So wherever they think they're going, when you launch them, you're not, they're not being launched alone. They're being sent, but, they're, but the Christ is present with them. So this, this idea of the coming of the Holy Spirit matters tremendously, but he, as we move forward, he says, so when they had come together, they asked him. So they're together. It's been over this 40-day period of time, and so now they're going to ask Jesus a question. Now, wouldn't you hope they'd start asking better questions at some point? Like, don't you think at some point they'd stop asking all this stuff about how does this affect me, right? And this one isn't pointedly so, but it's still not the right question. 
I mean, he's going to have to, and you do this, I think, in conversations as an adult. This is what we do, and some of you do it in a conversation with, another, with other adults. You, 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 you have to pivot from what they ask to what they really need to know. And that's what's about to go down right here, is they're going to ask a question that's not a great one, and Jesus is going to answer it, and then he's going to respond with what matters. So then they come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, here's what they wanted to know. I saw, we saw you suffer. We saw you rise from the grave. Is it time yet? Like, is now the time you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna come out in power and authority, and we're going to take care of business? Like, is it, is it time for us to take off? Like, is now, is now it? Are we going into beast mode, Jesus? Is that what we're fixing to do? Y'all got that illustration, right? F-35 beast mode. Do I have to explain this stuff to y'all? Come on. I know I've got way too much energy for 8, uh, whatever time it is, 8.54. All right, so hang, hang tight with me. They asked the question, uh, he said, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? So he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Now I want y'all to catch that just for a second. There is something that's very calming in that statement to me, and it should be to you. But it's also very informative. Like they were wanting to know, is now the time that you're going to do what we've been waiting for you to do? And honestly, and this is not, listen, this is not a rebuke in any way. I'm just, it's a focus issue. If we're asking the question, is today the day he's coming back? Is tomorrow the day he's coming back? Like, when's, it, when's he coming back? Can I just tell you what we're supposed to do when he comes back? We're supposed to be busy doing kingdom work. We're supposed to seek him and be sharing gospel. We've been sent as gospel missiles, right, with, with, with a gospel task. And he literally is telling them, hey, guys, don't focus on the wrong thing. You say, well, how do I know that's what he's telling them? He says, it's not. It's not for you to know. He's literally saying, guys, that's above your pay grade. You can keep on talking about it all you want. Number one, you ain't smart enough. And number two, um, I ain't got to tell you. Like, you're not, you're not due that information. You're like, what do you mean I'm not due that information? I, I'm me, and we know that I'm important, so he has to tell me. Nope. You need, to, you need to, like, dumb yourself down just a little bit. Like, you're in great value in the eyes of Christ, like, he loves you, he's prepared a place for you, but there's some decisions that you not only you do, not, do you not want to have to deal with, but he's not going to let you deal with, partly because it would be a distraction. I'm just going to tell you, here's the relieving part for me. I'm not in charge of that. Whew. Do you see how, how good that feels? Does anybody else, like, if you, live, if you lead in life, is there anybody else just glad there's something going on they're not in charge of? Like, so when you ask, look, we can talk about some of this stuff, but I've just got to be honest with you, I'm just going to keep shooting gospel. I'm just going to keep sending out gospel missiles, keep talking about Jesus, uh, and pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Now, I'll pray that prayer out of Revelation. i got no problem with that, because I know there is a heaven, and this ain't it, right? Um, but, but if i got to be somewhere between now and then, it might as well be Bay County. Amen, somebody. Is that good? Uh, and, and, so, and so, in light of all that, here's the deal. I'm comforted to know there's things outside of my authority. You need to be asking that on a whole lot of different levels. Like, that one issue is a place... But there's some other stuff you spend a ton of time on that's just not within your authority. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Like, if we're going to be focused and we're going to do the thing he's called us to do, we've got to be able to say, that one's not mine to fix. I, I'm not capable of doing really anything about, about that. It doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it doesn't have implications. It doesn't mean that God's not on the throne or God's not need, needing to be involved with it. But there are certain things in our life that we are going to wither away our strength and our energy emotionally and physically and even opportunities to share the gospel, spending time on, on things that are just not that important. Or maybe more, more importantly, because you, you, you could probably say, hey, but my thing's important. Yeah, but if it's not your thing, then it's still it's not something you should be spending your time on. It kind of relieves me to know there's things I can talk to God about and say, God, there's more on my list this week than I can do. Would you show me what I'm in charge of, please? Would, would, you, would you give me the freedom? I'm going to give you all an example. You're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm giving you something that's just not important, but it's, it's me disclosing, right? So I'm a little bit over the top on some things. I know that you all wouldn't imagine that a guy is like me would ever be that way, but like I want everything just so. And I don't know why some things are that way and other things are not. Like, Christy's got a whole lot. She's, she's really good with weeds, right? So she pulls weeds all the time. I'm so grateful. I married a woman that likes to pull weeds. Can, guys, you can't have her. Like, 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 this is amazing. And so, but, but across the street, there's an empty lot, and people like to put stuff there, and it gets grown up. And all this time, I've tried to keep it, like, just mowed so that we, 
And it's not much, right? But I, but I find myself, and I told Chris, I, I made a declaration yesterday. You know, I make these like never. And, uh, but I said, hey, I decided something. She said, what's that? I said, I've decided that whoever's lot that is is not my responsibility to fix. Like, I got enough to do this week. And keeping that one mowed and keeping it so it's not icky looking and I, it's just not mine anymore. I, I'm good with that. And I was like, my yard chores just got a little bit smaller. Do you see how that worked? And you got something in your life. I'm kind of belaboring this a little bit, but I want you to hear me say it. What is it in your life that's keeping you from being as effective as you should be because you're acting as though you're in authority over things that really aren't yours to fix? And so take, that deep, take a deep breath there. Pause on that. You may already know exactly what the thing is. As we continue in the text, though, not only does Jesus say, um, Guys, it's not for you to know the season. I mean, you, you can know the season or the time. That's fine. You're not really going to be specific on any of it, but it's fixed. It's under my authority. I got this. Got it, Lord. That one's yours. I'll work on the stuff I'm supposed to work on. Does anybody else sometimes see people that are, you, you actually want to talk, I mean, it's, it, we need to do the actual self-reflection on this, but there's a tendency to see it much easier than everybody else. Like, hey, would, somebody, would you go tap them on the shoulder and tell them to stop minding their own business? You're supposed to laugh right there because that's kind of, that's a real thing. Uh, maybe a teachable moment for parents with kids even. Um, so then he says, it's not for you to know, it's by my authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So he tells them two, tells them two things. The spirit that I promised, the empowerment to do the thing I've asked you to do, not the thing that's not within your authority, that power that's going to keep you from being an orphan, keep you from being all by yourself, that power that I, just, that, that I described Jesus would have said in John 14 when I told you not to be troubled, that though I'm leaving you, I'm going to give you everything you need to do what you're supposed to do. And I'm, you're going to be at peace because I'm there. That's coming. So we're 40 days in. Here, here's what's hard. I want you to literally see that Peter still has to wait. They're still in the waiting game. Like, when we try to figure out, okay, exactly what was the timeline? Loosely, three days between Passover like, and, and resurrection, and then you add 40 in that's described here. Uh, and then the week, I'm not sure where they got week from, but, but the week, essentially, that they were in the upper room, now you got 50. We're going to find that in Acts 2, when did all this happen? When, what was the day? It was Pentecost. They didn't even know that day, I don't think, specifically. But, but, but they knew that one day. And so we get this idea that every day they woke up and thought, are we there yet? It's today the day. What did they do in the meantime? Like, are you hearing me say they had to wait? Anybody else not like to wait? Anybody else? You're getting ready to go on some summer trips. I don't know what you're going to do to be in advance. Like, maybe this will be your way to go back and review a message with kids or something. But uh, they're going to start asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? How much longer? He said, you guys are going to have to wait. I'll let you know. And when it's time, you're going to have to do the thing. Now, the thing is to share the gospel. But it says in the meantime, listen to what they did. It says, uh, when he said these things, as they were looking, well, no, he's going to ascend into heaven. I kind of got this out of order. It's not out of order. It's just the point that I don't want to come back to it because I'm going to forget. I'll run out of time, all that good stuff. Here's the bottom line. He tells them right here um, that the, 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 the reality is that you're going to have to wait until it's time, and then the power is going to come upon you, and you'll be able to go do the thing that you're supposed to do. In the meantime, they prayed. It says down toward the bottom in verse uh, 14 that all were within one accord, and they were devoting themselves to prayer together with women, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So what did they do while they waited? They prayed. You say, well, things that, that aren't in your authority and you want God to make it right, what do you do? You pray. And when you know that you're about to have to, like, your time to do the thing you're supposed to do, your assignment is coming close, what are you going to do about it? You're going to pray. Mamas with kids moving into the next phase, you're worried about it. Pray. Whether they're moving into graduation or to college or to potty training, pray. I mean, when you're, when you're concerned about the next station or the next stop or the next job or the, the ne next diagnosis or the next step in the plan, what do you do? It's pretty clear that when we wait, we should be praying. And why? Well, because... If he's not made the time right yet, that means it's not within our authority unless there is some things we've been assigned to do. There's, it's not for us to fix in that moment. And so I think it's important for us to hear that part of our responsibility is to pray. It says that, that the disciples uh, were there. They, then they returned to Jerusalem from the, the mount. Hang on. I just missed the uh, ascension. I, I kind of ought to tell you the ascension in heaven. Uh, and, and when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up. The cloud took him out of their sight and while they were standing and Gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, 
and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Isn't it crazy? Jesus gave him instructions about not being focused on the wrong things right as he left. He told him certain things were within his authority. He told him to go um, to, to, to wait, and at the right time it would happen. And so there they stood just looking and just waiting for him to come back. I mean, they still thought, he told us what to do. We're just going to And so he, God left two guys right there, two angels, to say, hey, stop standing around and looking in the air and go do what you were told to do. Like, get after it. Like, we need, we, need some, we need God's word to tell us that sometimes, right? Like, in the meantime, don't just stand with your head in the air and your, your mind in the clouds, but continue to do the thing that you're supposed to do. And so um, the, he, he told them to, uh, to, to, to get, and so they did. He says they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. They'd entered the room. They went to the upper room. They were staying there with Peter and John. I want to make this note to you because I've deviated a little bit from my series to some extent because we're including Peter with all the stuff that's happening with the others. We saw Peter restored last week. Peter's the first one named here. Peter's the first one named just about any list of the disciples, but certainly in the book of Acts, after the restoration, it was Peter. Like, if they're going to name one, they may just name Peter, or they may say Peter and John, or they may say Peter and John and the disciples, or they may, it, but, but Peter is always the leader. Like, it was established even among the disciples at that point, they recognized him that way. And what I think is so glorious is that on that moment that we probably won't get to talk about today, where, where they, they have this moment and the Holy Spirit comes, it was Peter that stood along with the disciples, but it was out of Peter's mouth that the gospel was declared over and over. And if you look through the messages that they shared and the, the thing that they were about, man, they were dropping, I'm going to keep using the imagery, gospel bombs left and right. I mean, they were just telling that, hey, this Christ that you crucified, by his name you can be saved. And they were seeing people accept Christ as a result of it. Um, I think it's incredibly important for us to also, as we're recognizing that Peter was restored, God was not done. Some of y'all need to be encouraged that this is a picture of what life looks like after being restored. It's about the gospel. It's also important for you to note that there is a geographical thing going on here when he describes them being witnesses. He says, really from Jerusalem, and then it's an outward going deal, like from where you're at to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's not new to most of us, but it's, it's, it's kind of a good reminder. Because we get hung up in other things. And if we're going to get this this idea of being sent out as disciples and as believers of Jesus Christ, right? We've got to recognize that this thing we call the gospel of Jesus is to, is to roll over and in, in, in color every aspect of our life. You see, the way that the gospel is intended to work, the way that it's really described throughout and certainly it's described here, it's not this idea that I'm here on today and so I have my, my gospel hat on, my Christian hat, and tomorrow i got to go to work. And so because i got to go to business tomorrow, I'm going to take my Christian hat off, I'm going to sit it right here, and then I'm going I'm to be a student, or I'm going to be, a, I'm gonna be a, a teacher, or I'm going I'm to put my, uh, uh, my flight suit on, or uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to do the thing I do, put my white coat on, or I'm going to the attorney's office, I'm doing my thing, so I take, take this hat off, and then I put this hat on. Or I put my mom hat on, or my, or my parent hat, or my coach's hat. Here's what's, here's what's true. When you accept Jesus Christ, the task as a believer in Jesus Christ to, to let like to let God work through every aspect of your life, it colors how you do business and work. It colors how you lead. It colors how you parent. It colors how you, uh, how you teach. It colors everything. It's like, well, you, you, you can't do that in the modern world. There can't be any overlap. Somebody fed you a line of baloney because that's not what the gospel teaches. Like, even if it was somehow legalized that you, you can't do whatever, your life before the Lord should be a reflection. Like, it shouldn't be hard to figure out which side you're on. I mean, you should be nice. You should be kind. You should be gentle. You should be uh, strength under control. You should be meek. You should be all the things that, that, that Christ says that we should be, right? And, and, and what I'm describing is not, I use the term missile. It's a strong, it's an aggressive term. I get that. When you show up tomorrow, don't just start pounding on somebody, okay? Like, verbally, uh, in Jesus' name until they receive Jesus. Like, the Crusades are, like, bad. Like, we, we, we weren't supposed to do it that way. Like, that's not what God's called us to do. But timid, malnourished, undereducated believers that somehow think that a one-day-of-the-week influencing of the gospel is, a, like, is, that's what it was supposed to be, I'm here to blow that up. Because that's not in the Bible. Like, that's just not it. So what is it we're supposed to do? 
Well, I want to I give you a fundamental principle here that I think is important. Um, when, we, when we receive Christ, we typically think that salvation is like Jesus died for me. And Jesus died for you. And if you ever get it in your head that he loves you so much that he, he died for you, then all of a sudden you begin to think, oh, well, it's all for me. And so since he died for me, and I had plans to, you know, after school to do this or to do that, he's going to make my plans do better. And so uh, I'm going to include him in my plans, and because he loves me so much, he's going to make my plan happen. That's not exactly what the Bible says. The Bible literally says that you were the object of salvation so that you could perform, be about, do the thing that he's called. Like, like literally, we make ourselves as, as the literal object of salvation when really accomplishing the mission of Jesus Christ was the object. And so whenever the mission is to make believers in Christ, to make disciples that make disciples, and not just you getting out of your little pickle, you know what I mean by pickle, right? Difficult space. Time when you didn't know how to fix it yourself. When it becomes about something way bigger than just you, and it's about the mission, well, now all of a sudden it becomes a daily purpose. It becomes what I'm about all the time. Does, it, does, it, does that connect? And so here's what I need, I need you to get as believers in Christ. When we fail to see that our, our purpose as believers, he saved us so that we could share the gospel. He gave us good news so that we could share good news. He, 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 he chose us. We have been chosen. We have, been, we, we have responded by grace, believer's baptism, right? After we accept Christ, we put the sign that I surrender to him, put him in charge. Well, in light of those things, what am I to do? It's right here. We see it in Peter. He said, no, that's just for preachers. You can't prove it. I can prove it's not, but you can't prove it is. And the reason I know is because I know the book. I'm not saying I'm better than you. Let's look. Let's see. Let's do what we were created to do. In, in, in Corinthians, it says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Right? The old has gone. The new has come. Here's what that means. It colors everything. He talks in Ephesians about taking off the old and putting on the new. There's garments that don't any, any longer reflect Christ. And so I'm going to let him shape me and, and, and mold me and make me different day by day, more like him, because what I was before didn't fit who I am in Christ. He's made me new. Just a couple of verses after he says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. It says, we are ambassadors for Christ. So here's the deal. Whole kit and caboodle. Can y'all flip back to the picture of the missile for me just a second? The one that I circled. You're the missile. When you leave out of here, you're getting sent live off the rails. You are the church if you've accepted Jesus Christ. And he has sent us apostolos. He sent us live off the rails, promising to empower us to do the thing that he's called us to do. Now, I don't know what the specifics of all the rest of that stuff look like in your life, but I know that it starts with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And apart from that, we're not going to get it right. How do we get to that place? Well, number one, we recognize there's some things that are not within our authority and that we're not in charge of or supposed to fix or even be about it because he's, he's assigned you uniquely to some things, and we could go to the, many of the messages. We, he's assigned you to some stuff he's never going to assign to me, to some kids, to some, some people that you work with, to, to some circles that I'll never get into. He's assigned you. And so literally when we leave this place, it's not just till we come back the next it's, We're leaving, we're sending Live, sending you live off the rail in Jesus' name. As parents, let me just make this connection. This whole process of being able to have children and raise them and launch them into life, there is a very emotional part of what happens in that, okay, now they're caught in college, now they're married. But if I'm looking at purpose, man, the why drives things. It has to be the why that we recognize the, or, or we're going to get backwards. You raise them to launch them. You raise them, if you're, if you're, if you're in the right place scripturally, like with what God has said, you raise them because you're going to send them out. Live off the rail, trained, equipped, ready to do the thing God's called them to do to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. If you've never lived life with that kind of purpose, I invite you to. Because it's the only life that's going to stand true. It's the only life when you get done with all of our agendas and our, our, our stuff and our money and our, the things that we want to accomplish. Those things aren't, but those aren't the thing. I encourage you to live life on purpose and to be sent. Because that's what he's created you for.
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the, the example that we have in Peter and the apostles. Thank you for the transformation, the boldness that we see in their lives. Lord, I am grateful that in the, in the coming week we get to look at what the, the effect was, like the, what the, the, the force applied as a result of being sent out live off the rails was in Peter's life. Lord, 30 years of gospel ministry made a huge impact. And Lord, I pray that as we are sent, and as we go live life and do the mission you've called us to do, that we would have good effect, that the things that, that, that we're about would have an impact in all the right ways. Father, bless this group of folks today. Help us as we, as we sing of your love for us in this moment, and then as we literally uh, are, are ready for takeoff after that. I pray that we would contemplate things we need to let go of, things that we need to not be so concerned with. Pray about uh, this time of waiting uh, on things that are just, it's not time yet. And then, Father, help us never forget the thing that should color everything which is this gospel we have been sent to declare. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.